The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. <laughs> you always get a little bit uncomfortable whenever you uh, you start the broadcast and show your slides and like everything goes completely black. It's like, oh my god, it's just crashing out on us right now. Um, so everybody, we're gonna get started here in just a couple of minutes. Uh, we got a bunch of people that are that are joining in. If you guys can hear us, if you could please uh, type in like questions uh, in the questions area. Yes, you can hear us. That would be super cool. Um, so go ahead and type that out. Cool. And can you guys see the slides as well? You're clicking in the background. That's not creepy. It's just me clicking all the people that say, yes, they can hear me. And some of you jackasses that are like, no, I can't hear you at all. Uh, so thank you so much. Cannot see the slides. Yes, no slides. No slides, no see slides. Okay, I need to stop asking questions to, to 150 people. Um, that's just got to stop at some point. So we're gonna share this main screen. And we'll show the screen. There we go. So now we should see the slides. And you guys are starting to type that in. All right, we'll get started here in just about two minutes. Burn it, burn it, burn it, burn it. Yeah, I, I, I got to get used to this. You know, usually we, we have like, you know, maybe 150 people logged in at this time, and we're already up to like 220. Um, and it starts like just skyrocketing. Thanks. So Pyromaniacs. Pyro Thank you, Alan. Um, also with me, um, we, we, we kind of have that, that sort of cool thing I was going to talk about today uh, for bypassing AV and such. And I have Brian with me. So Brian, why don't you tell people a little bit about who you are? Because Brian's going to be showing up on a lot more webcasts, and especially in some of our advanced stuff. Because I'm going to be honest, I'm an idiot. Um, I, I, my, I told you guys this joke last time. We got into an argument over what text editor people like, you know, Nano, VI, Emacs. And uh, Ethan pointed out that PowerPoint is my editor of choice. And that hurt a lot. Um, so I'm getting smarter people than I to do some more technical things, and Brian's going to be here, and Brian's one of those people. So go ahead, Brian. Oh. Hey, guys. Uh, yep, this is Brian. I am uh, work here with John at EHIS, um, developer, researcher, pen tester, security enthusiast, lots of other cool things. So, And uh, you have a class coming up at Black Hat, I believe. Uh, Black Hat Singapore, right? Yep. Is that correct? Okay. Yep, that'll be in uh, late March. There's still time for the early bird sign up if anyone's interested. We'll be going over lots of cool uh, things like uh, bypassing AV. I'll be showing you uh, how to develop your own custom malware and a lot of other really cool tools uh, that, you could, that you can use and play around with. Very cool. And I'll be hanging out more on some Security Weekly stuff as we progress. So let's go ahead and let's get started. I want to make sure that we are, in fact, recording. Uh, it looks like we are, in fact, recording, which is good. Uh, that's fantastic. Have a good set of turnout. So uh, the name of this webcast is Burn It All. Let's start over again. And this is a very inflammatory uh, webcast title. And, and the reason why I did this is a number of reasons. One, to catch people's attention, of course. But the other reason why I wanted to do this is I honestly believe that we do need to start cutting things down. I, you know, Brian, I mean, how many tests have we seen over the past, like, say, 12 months where we see companies that are, quote, unquote, doing it right and they continue to get compromised? Oh, so. countless. There's, there's always something. <laughs> yeah, always. Oh, yeah. And not only that, but we're seeing the same something mm -hmm. again and again and again and again. And we need to try to address that as much as possible moving forward. So let's get jumped right in. It's brought to you by uh, SANS 504, Hacker Techniques, Exploits, and Incident Handling. It's also brought to you by Black Hills Information Security. We do pen tests and security stuff. I'm not going to spend too much time on pitches. All right, so how do bad things happen? Uh, I'm, I'm very interested in trying to discover not just that things are fundamentally broken, which, of course, I, I believe deep down they actually are. But I think that there's more to it than that. Uh, how do we actually end up to the position that we're at now, where organizations are being compromised pretty much at will um, and pretty much getting compromised in the exact same ways for initial compromise, but also post-exploitation, what happens after that? And there, we seem to be in a, a really, really kind of nasty loop. Um, we, have the, we have the screenshot over here. I was looking for like loop fail pictures this morning really early. I came across this one. It was experiment, fail, learn, repeat. I mean, that's the concepts and the tenets of science. That's the concepts and tenets of learning is you're going to try things, you're going to fail, and then you're going to move on. And, and a lot of people, you know, they joke with me. They're like, how did you, how did you get good at computer security? And it's just that I, I have a really, really high tolerance for failure. Um, I fail all the time. I constantly, constantly fail, whether it's, you know, setting up a network adapter 10 years ago or uh, trying to get certain kernel builds for operating systems running 
I, I fail very regularly. But in that failure, you tend to learn. The problem is if we're looking at the loop that we're in right now in IT security, we are not learning. We do the experiment, fail, repeat, experiment, fail, repeat. And we tend to do the exact same experiments again and again and again and again. And I, I, I've been starting to get kind of angry at questions whenever I teach class. And I know I shouldn't get angry. And I don't think people necessarily want me to say I'm getting angry at certain questions, but I'm starting to. And I wanted to kind of have this webcast kind of get these things out and start communicating more effectively with what we need to do. We get questions all the time, whether we're teaching SANS 504 or I'm doing IONS discussions or, or you know, emails come in for Security Weekly or, uh, teach, like I said, teaching for SANS or even these webcasts and debriefs with customers. You go through and you explain everything that went wrong in a penetration test. And then ultimately the questions come back to, well, that's great. So what exactly is the best antivirus for us to use? after we bypassed it because they believe that somehow their antivirus is faulty. They just simply need to go out and buy a new one. What's the best data loss prevention product? What's the best threat intelligence feed? What's the best firewall? And we keep on saying it's not an issue of these firewalls or threat intelligence feeds or DLP or AV or IPS, IDS, whatever the hell it is that people are looking into. It, it has to go back to some more fundamental issues within our organizations. And unfortunately, whenever we're talking to CEOs, CFOs, COOs, they do not like the answers that we give them. In fact, this webcast is chock full with uh, recommendations that a lot of people are not going to like. And what we're going to say is all of this crap that's on the slide that is not working is going to continue to not work. And uh, there's a number of reasons why I'll get to that on the next slide with Dr. Zoidberg. But we need to fundamentally change the way we look at trying to secure our networks instead of trying to do the same things that we've been doing over and over and over again. So let's talk about Dr. Zoidberg. Um, so password examples. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. I talked to many customers and they ask, well, what, what should we do for password complexity? Uh, and I will say, you know, well, you should really, you know, have long passwords. Honestly, long passwords are the only things that ultimately matter whenever it comes to computer security. And they come back and they say, well, um, our password requirements are greater than eight characters, upper, lowercase, alphanumeric, uh, no dictionary words, and it's full of fail. And I say that that is not a good password complexity requirement policy. And they say we cannot fix this uh, because of compliance, because our compliance standards state this is what we have to use. So management and everyone says that that's what we're going to do. And I will, I will argue with people and say you shouldn't do that. That's a bad password complexity uh, set up and they say, well, how, how, would, how would you fight it? And ultimately, whenever you're trying to argue compliance, it, it's difficult because you're arguing with like the Ten Commandments, something that was written in stone and no one wants to wants to argue those things. You know, it, it's basically some other group of people elsewhere who clearly must be smarter than we are came up with a standard and that standard is now enforceable, whether it be PCI based environments or HIPAA based environments or um, you know, a SOC 3 compliance environment or DOD, NIST 853, or excuse me, NIST 853 environments, DOD, DICAP, DITSCAP, a DSCID 6.3 risk management framework. They all go back to these documents as though these documents came from on high. And honestly, if you actually start looking at how these documents and these compliance standards themselves are actually created, it's actually horrifying how they're actually created. Because the exact same arguments and conversations that we have about changing compliance, i.e. somebody else told us to do this, they must be smarter, are the exact same conversations that they have whenever they develop new compliance standards. So whenever somebody creates a new compliance standard, I mean somebody like an organization, be it uh, government or uh, defense-based organization, when they set out to create new standards of security, they don't like to rehash or reinvent the wheel. They're going to look backwards and they're going to say, what were the previous standards? We're going to build upon those standards with a few small tweaks. And that keeps going. And it just keeps progressing on and on and on and on and on. And we're looking at password complexity requirements for security. Ultimately, everything goes back to the NIST Green Book. Uh, you can find this just by doing a simple Google search and uh, searching for NIST Green Book, and it'll take you right to the website um, that I'm looking at right here. And if you do a search for the word days, it'll take you to the sections where they came up with password complexity requirements. So you can see here up in the upper left, it says L is set for six months and 12 months, P is set for one in million, uh, one in one million acceptable probability of guessing the password. And R is set at 8.5 guesses per minute, which is the guess rate possible with a 300 baud service. Um, I, I forgot to mention that the NIST Green Book series was released in 1985. So it was all the way back in 1985, where they were concerned that a bad guy that could do 8.5 guesses per minute 
would exhaust all password possibilities um, with you know an eight character password. So they have some math in here kind of explaining it and they come up with a length of what the passwords should be and how long that password should exist. So if you're using like a nine character password, the longest that you should have is uh, for a lifetime is six months, nine character passwords for 12 months. And we talk about rounding 36 and 26 character alphabets, but they're looking at password links of eight, nine characters and how long you should use those passwords. And many organizations, unfortunately, create a password complexity policy that says it's going to be eight characters and you have to change your password once every three months. And all of that is based on something that was written and released in 1985. So this is the genesis. So the way that you actually fight the compliance argument is you sit down with people and you go back in time to the NIST Green Book series and you say, this is where that password complexity requirement started. And if you're not going to be in compliance with that password complexity requirement, all you need to say is we're not in compliance with that standard. We exceed that standard um, as it is with length. And I've got my length slides out of order here. I don't even know where my password length slide is, but anyway, right? Um, so basically it all goes back to the green book and password length is the only thing that matters whatsoever. So we've been beating on this for a long, long, long time. We've done the cash cow tipping series two years in a row. Um, and, and how did you bypass uh, last year? You did WebRoot, what, wasn't it? So what was your, your approach for bypassing WebRoot? Um, two things. One was uh, basically just uh, creating a C-sharp program uh, that just called out to, to PowerShell so you end up with an executable you can drop right onto disk and AV doesn't have a clue, uh, get an interpreter session back. The other one was uh, based on some uh, research that Joff and others have done of just uh, modifying the, the standard interpreter template um, that, that you see within uh, Metasploit that gets generated. And really, it's just a matter of just taking that template. It's maybe 20 lines of code. You add in a couple extra lines of code, recompile it. AB doesn't have a clue. Yeah, it was. Uh, I think the code you added in was X equals 10, Y equals zero, add X and Y. Yep, exactly. And, and it blew right through it. Yep. So we, we've been spending a lot of time talking about how how to bypass these security technologies, right? And the whole reason why we're doing this, I'll get to in a couple of minutes whenever we start talking about architecture, is we need to bypass everything, right? We got to bypass AV, DLP, firewalls, and it's very trivial to do, and it's ultimately a lot of smoke and mirrors. You talk to these vendors, you get the sales pitches from these vendors, and they keep on trying to sell you that, uh, that kind of easy button. They keep on trying to sell you the silver bullet. You know, we're going to advance the or uh, detect the advanced persistent attacks. I love walking through, uh, I love walking through airports and seeing great big huge signs for uh, Barracuda, right? Barracuda networks. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Ne network security solved. So network security solved, yeah. um, stopping 99.9% .9 of attacks that hit your network today. And uh, yeah, that's that's not the reality of the situation. Um, you know, it's just not the way the situation works. And if you're curious about what we're talking about, we have previous sessions, slides, step-by-step -step instructions on bypassing AV at tinyurl.com forward slash 504 extra. Um, but ultimately this isn't gonna get better. Uh, this is something that Brian found yesterday um, that I thought kind of articulates just how fragile security is. So Brian, why don't you kind of explain the test you were doing and uh, the way that you bypassed it? Yeah, so I was working on uh, spear phishing for a customer, and uh, what my ruse was going to be, uh, the payload delivery anyways, is going to set up, um, you know, like a Word document with a macro in it that calls out to PowerShell. Um, pretty standard. Uh, generated the macro just using PowerShell Empire, um, dropped it in, and then I went to, to mail it out, and uh, to my surprise, something new popped up. Um, Gmail blocked me from sending it, um, said that it was potentially a security issue. Um, so I went ahead, I used another um, another mail server, I think I used like Yahoo or something like that, um, and sent it to my GMX mail account. And also to my surprise, when I went to check my inbox, it gave me a nice little message that said that it had detected a virus. And so I was, I was curious about this. I thought about it a little bit. And it, it can't be blocking it just because there's a macro in there, right? I mean, there are legitimate uses for macros, otherwise it wouldn't be a feature. So after playing around with it a little bit, um, I found that, that what was happening is that all they're doing is they're, they're literally just looking for the word PowerShell. That's, that's their protection measure for this. All they're doing is going through, they look at the macro and they look just for the word PowerShell. Um, and they say, oh no, this is, this is a virus. This is, this is bad. So how do we get around it? Literally just breaking it up into two strings. I just took the, the L.exe off the end of it, um, put the, you know, the PowerShell <laughs> on its own line. Um, created the string and it thinks it's completely legit. And and that's that's kind of indicative of the amount of effort that goes into bypassing most of these products. 
whether it's creating VS agent in a back door or trying to bypass AV and just get it to, to work. It's just, yeah, it is becoming that simple to try to bypass these products. So let's, let's start talking about moving forward. Um, you know, these things do not work. We need to leave old things behind. Um, antivirus, data loss prevention products, firewalls, cyber threat intelligence feeds, cyber kill chain, any of this crap. Um, I look at it as something that you need to have to keep kind of like cruft off of the network. But in all honesty, they're not going to stop advanced adversaries ever. They're just not. Um, you can walk the floor at RSA and see literally dozens, if not uh, hundreds of companies that are trying to repackage and resell the exact same crap that they've been trying to sell to you for the past 10 years. Let's leave these things behind. So the question quickly is, if we started over, right, if we were going to start everything all over again, how would we do it differently? What would we do? And mainly we got to let like a lot of the baggage go that we've been carrying around for years and we have to let that go. And it's basically everything we're going to talk about from here on out has to do with what Brian and myself have been seeing in tests and training and trying to break out of the exact same loops and patterns that we see again and again and again. And to be completely honest, a lot of this is basically uh, we're putting out on the webcast. It's going to make our life more difficult. I have had a number of pen testers who have uh, contacted us. Can you shut the door? Yeah. Who have contacted us. We just had Thai food delivered to the office and uh, we are crinkling. And uh, I'm going to be honest, Brian and I are now very distracted uh, by that. But a lot of this is based upon the patterns that we've been seeing. And I've had testers, other pen testers attending my classes. And I'm like, why the hell are you telling people to do X, Y, and Z? That's going to make things harder for us. And that's the goal. That's ultimately what we're after. Um, I don't want to be doing the exact same things that we've been doing for the next five years that we've been doing for the previous five years, because that's just not a cool job. Uh, we might as well go into an assembly line and just start stamping out, stamping out things. So first and foremost, internet whitelisting. Uh, this is probably the one that gets everybody the most excited anytime I bring it up. They say, well, there's no way we can do internet whitelisting at all because they just, you know, it's impossible. It's just really, really, really difficult to do. And, and it's not, honestly, it's really, really just not at all to, it's not all that difficult to do this. So, but let, let's talk about it. So we've had a couple of people so far that have some questions. John's said, all this is great, but are we going to give solutions? Absolutely. Um, compliance is the minimum. Lee always has a good, has a good, um, has a good, a good approach with it. Minimum. A lot of people saying that compliance is the minimum. So we're going to go through and just blow away a lot of this. Um, if all of these are broken, how would you secure your network? That's what we're getting to, Adele. Uh, zero trust whitelist internal sites. No, no, you can absolutely do that. That's easy. You can actually go in and specify domains. We've had a number of webcasts where we've shown how you can bypass internet whitelist by putting in a, a whitelisted domain in the URL as a parameter. And when we're talking about internet whitelisting, we're not talking about from perspective, this is going to stop everything. But damn it, we just want to basically reduce it down to the point where it's not as bad as it is today. So internet blacklisting will not work ever under any circumstances. It just will not work um, it, ever, ever, ever under any, in, after any circumstances. And I'm going to talk about restricting categories here in just a little bit. There's a category called uncategorized that many people allow. They go through and they allow news sites. They allow maybe social networking sites. They block porn websites. They block all kinds of political websites. But once it gets done categorized, like, mm, what the hell, we'll let that go. So as I said, please don't pull out the pitchforks quite yet. Put them away. You can do this. Out of all the things that we're going to discuss, this is one of the easiest things for your organization to do. And also, when we're talking about this, this isn't new. Um, this is a slide from uh, Marcus Ranum 11 years ago. Um, it's the badness gap slide. So it basically says the number of legitimate apps and traffic, number of hostile apps and traffic and how it's growing. And like I said, this is something that he wrote and he released 11 years ago. And it hasn't it hasn't really improved since then. Uh, the point is there's almost an infinite amount of evil websites that exist that there's no way you're going to be able to blacklist every single one of them as well. So let's talk about how we can do this. So what's the source of this graph? Tyler asked. Um, if you Google six dumbest ideas in computer security, um, it is from Marcus Random's website. So six dumbest ideas in computer security. So here we go. Let's move forward. So let's play a game. We're going to go through, we're going to talk about internet whitelisting because everyone, when they think about internet whitelisting, they think about it in the most difficult, painful incarnation of it possible. And what that looks like is every single website has to be vetted by a star chamber. We're going to get together 15 people 
And we're all going to make a website by website decision as to whether or not we're going to allow this website or not. Then it's going to go to a vote. And then there's going to be a white paper that's drafted. And then it's going to have executive approval. Then it's going to have to go to HR. To hell with that. We're not doing that. Please just get, get that off the table. Okay. So let's play a game. How many legitimate websites do your users go to? Is it 200, 500, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 websites? Really, this should be a question that you should be able to find out. Um, basically, run some packet capture at the edge of your networks and look at what websites your people go to. And then maybe, just maybe, we allow them with some reason, right? We'll go through and we'll remove ads. We'll, we'll let them die. Um, but we're still going to block porn websites and alcohol websites, but we're going to create this whitelist that is a whole bunch of websites that your users are going to, um, not necessarily for their job, but they're going to this, these websites because they, they enjoy them. They're going to CNN, they're going to like maybe Google News, they're going to, let's even say things like Facebook, you know, whatever. They're going to these websites that are like the Alexia Top 500, and they're not porn and not gambling websites. Just allow them to go to those websites. Uh, just basically go through and, and allow them out, right? If somebody calls you up, they're like, I really want to go to pineapplepistachioalmond.com. You're like, okay, I'll look at it. It doesn't look like porn or gambling. All right, you can go. So if you take a look at this, even if you allow the top 3,000, 4,000 websites, would your total exposure be more or less than what you have right now? Um, the, the important thing is it would be dramatically less. I mean, we're talking orders of magnitude less than what you have right now, because if you're allowing if you're allowing uncategorized, the way that we bypass and break into your organization at BHIS is we simply just create a new website and a new domain, and it's not going to be on the blacklist, at least not immediately. Um, they tend to show up fairly quickly after a couple of months, but it's not going to be there. And an advanced adversary can do it as well. So we got a couple of comments and questions. Tim had some at a good point. Um, something has to be, go on the import endpoint, right? Um, we're 17 or 19 minutes into the webcast. We are going to be talking about that here in just a couple of seconds, Tim. So just sit tight. I can't block porn and alcohol website, academic freedom. You actually can, Lee. Um, this is one of those big mi not mistakes, but it's one of those uh, straw men. Anytime you're at a university, they say, well, you can't block these websites because of academic freedom. But if you are allowing your support staff, if you are allowing the people that run the university, the financial office, to go through the exact same rules that you create for students and the exact same rules that you create for academic, academics like doctors, that's your problem. You really need to try to create two separate network segments, one for the business management of the university and one for the academic people. Just basically let those things run wild. So you can create two sets of rules without question. You absolutely can. Um, Dallas brought up not just business use. What about common websites? Absolutely. Well, now, wait a minute. Now, if you're looking at Harvard malware for Forbes, Forbes itself wasn't harboring the malware. Rather, what was happening is advertisements that were on Forbes were running the malware. So Forbes.com would be fine. That would be absolutely not a problem. But if somebody tries to load malware into Forbes through an advertisement, then that advertisement would not trigger because it would not be on your whitelist. Very, very good. Will the slide deck be available, Kyle asked? Absolutely. CNN is riddled with cross-site scripting. Absolutely. But a lot of times cross-site scripting is utilized to get you to load content in the form of ads or malware from another website. Once again, you may allow CNN, but the fact of the matter is as soon as that cross-site scripting triggers, it's not going to fire appropriately because the website that they're referring you to is not going to be web, is not going to be um, whitelisted. Some sites won't lo load unless uh, the trackers are enabled. And I've seen some of those websites. Somebody's trying to go to, like we talked about the Forbes thing, where they're like, hey, you have to shut off your ad blocker and all that, then don't go to that website. Um, I've considered researching which employees need to be using the internet. Um, yeah, you can absolutely do that. Break it down into different groups, roles, and responsibilities. How is a site about nuts not considered porn? Uh, oh, he's talking about my reference to the uh, Power Supply Pistachio uh, Almond website. I did, that's just what he has on his desk. He has a... Uh, is this a power supply or is it, this a pineapple? It, it is. It's a power supply with a pineapple sticker. Okay, it's a pineapple. Yeah. It's got me interested in that. Um, so... So you could even do user self-service. Kurt is going to the far extreme. I would say even that is better than what we have now. They just go to a website and say, I want to go to pineapple.com. Okay, cool. They absolutely can. The point is not to make it completely, completely secure. It's basically just uh, trying to get things better than where they are. Um, Matthew brought up a great question. I visited CNN.com, and according to Lightbeam for Firefox, my browser hit 29 cents. 
uh, 29 sites. No, a lot of those are well-known and established advertising websites. And in fact, you can actually shut that off within your filters, whether it be a blue coat or WebSense. You can actually block those, or you can use services like OpenDNS to filter those out. Uh, da -da -da -da, segmenting University, Segmenting University, Malvertising is a good site and a great Twitter feed. Um, ads can't be displayed. Who's going to pay for the internet? I don't care. Uh, this is a great question from Brian. Um, who's going to pay for the internet? All of those, you know, billions of other users that are viewing the websites through their browser on their phone or viewing it from home, not necessarily on a uh, on a uh, uh, on, on a work website as well. But everyone wants encryption everywhere. Encryption's fine, and your your WebSense proxy or your blue code or whatever you're using should have the ability to intercept and expect that as well. Um, a content delivery networks hard to manage and whitelist while keeping the bad stuff out. Like you're talking about Akamai, and that is absolutely true. Um, however, once again, a lot of the advertising sites, not all of them, are pretty well known um, as far as what the domains are. And uh, dude, you need a video feed with these talks. Uh, why? So you can see the uh, so you can see us. Okay, well, fine. Here's a video feed, and we gotta open up the little thing. He's trying to clean his desk now. No, no, no. I was gonna show him. Oh, the, you're uh, showing him the stuff. So yeah, here, yeah here's the uh, pineapple, pistachio, almond, and that's Brian. Yeah. Um, so there you go. There's your video feed. Um, I don't know what you guys can actually see for the video feed, so maybe we'll just keep it on. Um, I, I don't know. It's kind of sure, weird. Sure. Um, we've got the executive BHIS desk. This is uh, my desk when I visit BHIS offices. And uh, we also have a kitty uh, bed down there. So now, there you go, Lee. There's your, uh, there's your video feed. All right. Da, 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 da. All right, so we're moving. Get rid of it. A lot of people are saying hi to Brian. Oh, the beard looks good uh, on me. I, I, I wanted to look more like Brian, uh, okay. actually. Um, no, I think you had it first. I, I did? Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway. Um, all right, let's move on. Oh, so, so we talk about filtering. So how do we allow websites that are legitimate websites? So you can see up here on the on the website, we have adware, alcohol, anonymizer, art. Let's allow art. Business services, let's allow those. Cars and transportation, sure, what the hell. Um, community sites, compromised websites, yeah, no, don't, don't allow those in. No. Computer technology, criminal skills, and hacking, which BHIS is now on that website, or is on that list, believe oh, it or not. We're yeah. now there. Dating websites, we are not on the dating website, uh, so that, that's good. But you can allow a bunch of these, but once you get over here to the uncategorized area, once you get to uncategorized, you're going to block those. So you're basically gonna say, we're going to block anything that is set up to be uncategorized. So that's kind of the best approach for it. Twin, actually a funny joke, you know, Alan talked about twin. Um, so uh, I'm wearing pants, lies, Tyler, lies. Um, but uh, twins, uh, what's your birthday? August sixth. My birthday is August sixth. There you go. So there you go. That's just two, that's just two grown men who can't get enough of each other. All right. So application whitelisting. Um, now we can move to the desktop, right? So we're going to application whitelisting. This one is not easy. And ultimately, the reason why this one is not easy is because a lot of people, when they try to do this, they try to jump right into full-on application whitelisting. I'll talk about this more on the next slide. But it, 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 we have this weird binary view of everything. It's all about, you know, how can we break something? And this is, we're, we're just as much at fault for this as well. If we can find a way to break it, a lot of people misinterpret us saying that, that it's completely worthless. Now, the things that are consistently broken, uh, just all the time, like AV and, and firewalls, those are always, always, always broken. And that, that's, I just don't think that's going to be fixed. You're, you're never going to fix that. When you're looking at application whitelisting, people say, well, you can bypass it with ISR Evil Grade. You can bypass it with Java applets if they allow JAR files. You can bypass it with PowerShell because they globally allow PowerShell. Great. That's all true. But the point of all of that is that your total attackable surface is reduced dramatically because you just not every single drive-by download can execute. If it's going into the Internet Explorer temporary folder and then executing, that's a problem. If somebody can download it to their desktop, like the fish you're going to be setting up here shortly, and then trying to execute, that is a problem. And that's what we're trying to get away from. And this will shut down like 99% of your drive-by downloads. And that's the value, right? That's the value. Um, and by the way, I have a picture of this pug that's not very happy. I had to throw that in because Paul loves his pugs. 
Um, Stella is the only pug I know his na the name of, but he loves his pugs dearly, and I just think they're just really incredibly ugly and cute dogs at the same time. Lee popped up. Uh, whitelist may achieve wins by starting with critical limited purpose and systems before moving to desktop. I would probably take that the opposite. I would start at the workstations. We'll talk about how to implement this effectively here in two slides. So far, a lot of this can be controlled by a pan device if it's set up properly. <laughs> is it a plug? No, I'm not coming up with a, with a, with a talk on that. Um, uh, so yeah, application whitelisting, Kevin brought up, said it's not as difficult as some people think. They just need to try it. Uh, you also have executives that demand full and complete access. How to say no? And that, that's, that's a much longer conversation, right? Ultimately, you have to get buy-in at the executive level and uh, you're going to need to have HR in the room. I have found if you're ever talking with executives on security policies that you're putting into place, if you have HR and they say things like, um, well, I want to allow this for just the executives. HR has no problem usually stepping on the throats of executives and saying things like, well, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Um, so bring them, uh, bring them in. How much for the dog? How much for the little girl Curtis brought up? Uh, so all of this ultimately is about architecture. And I've talked about this time and time and time again. You identify the failure points and then you find mitigations, weaknesses, mitigations, planning mitigations, component failure mitigations. And uh, the, the point of all of that is we can find ways to bypass application whitelisting or software restriction policies without question, but then we can start mitigating around it. If you're dealing with AV, which is just so fundamentally broken, there are no mitigations. An advanced attacker is going to bypass it and they're going to run malware on your network. That is an absolute given. If you're looking at uh, websites and blacklisting evil websites, they're going to break that. That's not even a component that you can mitigate around. It's just broken itself as well. All right, so start here with your software restriction policies. Work with app locker and software restriction policies and lockdown directories. So that would be like the Windows directory, program files, program files x86. If you have some applications that execute in other weird directories, you would allow those. I have a number of students that bring up that applications they use in their environment will actually download and execute in the temporary internet folder. And believe it or not, that's actually okay. What you can do is you can put in and say that that app is allowed to execute in that directory. Um, you can actually test it or lock it down by digital code signing certificate, or you can lock it down by the name of the executable, which is dangerous or you can lock it down by the MD5 hash of the executable. So you can take these exceptions and then you can start creating smaller mitigations, but set the directories where things should execute first and then start building up. Um, build slowly. If you try to jump straight to bit nine and you're doing full on application whitelisting and executable whitelisting, it's going to consistently fail for you and it's going to hurt a lot when you try to get this to work. So, all right, here we go. Tom brought up MD5. Maybe SHA both, absolutely. Can't you start by running whitelisting apps like AppLocker and Audit Mode? You absolutely can. So then you can learn what is going to execute and then you can push out your policy as well. But don't forget that exceptions need review and renewal. Absolutely true. Right. I, I think that that's, but that's getting into the new concept of uh, security. Just say no to permanent exceptions. I would have one cut where this wouldn't be the case. I would create permanent exceptions if you have digital code signing certificates from a code shop that you're going to trust. Let's say that you have an app developer company. Uh, let's say that you're using, I don't know, you're using Accenture, right, or Bearing Point, and they're gonna write apps for you and they're gonna update releases of the app. You can make sure that they have everything signed with a digital code signing certificate, and you can say that anything that comes from that code signing certificate is going to be trusted as well. I, I like Charles. Go to meeting presentation software is a pain with AppLocker since everyone has version number is different. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. That, that, that can be very, very difficult when trying to trigger it. But you can also get into the situation where GoToMeeting starts updating it. And you can also create execution where it downloads or execution exceptions where if it downloads from GoToMeeting, it is allowed as well. Further protection might include deep freeze to safeguard directory lockdown. I like that one too. Many folks, including IT people, feel advanced attackers are rare and unlikely to take the interest. How would you respond? Um, uh, I, I would just point at this poor little pen testing company in uh, Deadwood, South Dakota. Um, these guys bypass it. And I mean, we just got running water and power like what? Like last month? Yeah, it was very recent. It was, it was very, very was recent. Uh, it was awesome. Um, we, exceptionally, we, we especially like penicillin and refrigeration as well. All right. Should be a criteria for business be highly restricted, it's heavily dependent. Now, Perry, your point is interesting because a lot of times when we see people become very restrictive environments, 
it's usually after they've been exploited. You know, they call us in, we, we kind of help clean it up, we find vulnerabilities, and then they lock everything down. And a ton of things that wouldn't normally be possible politically all of a sudden are um, locked out. So we got some other things. Now, this is also interesting. Uh, Dale brought up, is there a malware that runs in memory and not locally installed? But almost every piece of malware does have some type of stager that drops on the system first, yeah, right? It's got to create the, the process originally before it can uh, do the injection, typically. Typically. And yeah. that stager drops and then it pulls the rest of the malware in memory. So yeah. it has to do something mm -hmm. there as well. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, could you... Uh, back into configuration management consistent baseline. That is a win, but that gets really, really hard as well. Please help convince Microsoft that AppLocker should be pro versions and not just enterprise. Oh, I like that. Um, we see a lot of cool security features that you have to be at this tier to be able to implement it effectively. All right, the next thing, and this is easy. Um, we had that customer that Ethan was testing a year ago, one of our first major large customers that had this enabled, that they turned on their firewalls and all their workstations. Um, I think they were a McAfee shop and uh, they enabled the firewall so none of their workstations could talk to each other. After Ethan got, uh, was, got, was able to execute on the network and start attacking systems on the network, like the local network that we were on with the admins, we had like 42 systems that had pop-ups, that there's a system that's doing something bad. Turn it on. Um, it works whenever you go to a coffee shop and Microsoft Windows says, hey, this is a public network. I'm gonna lock myself down and enable the firewall and try and make it far more difficult for people to talk to me. Yeah, treat your internal network as hostile because it ultimately is. There's no good reason to have your workstations talk to each other at all. And what this effectively does is it breaks down our ability to effectively pivot in the network. So I kind of want to walk through an exploit and how this works, uh, so how we move around as well. So here we go. Well, you just take your standard exploit. Somehow I get malware. It can be a drive-by download. It could be an exploit for Adobe Acrobat. It could be an exploit for Flash. It could be an exploit for just about anything, right? So we set that up. We've got your standard exploit running. I get access to one computer system. Now, the thing that a lot of people are not talking about is what happens next, okay? There's still a tremendous amount of focus on malware and uh, spreading around the environment. If we can create an effective um, IOC, indicators of compromise for malware, we'll be able to detect it in our environment. And a lot of that thinking is from uh, 10 years ago, if not longer, maybe 11 to 12 to 13 years ago. Because it used to be if you were hit by Nachi or Blaster or Weltria or any of those, it would hit one system and then it would spread to the rest of the systems in the environment. And many people believe that's the way malware works today. And it in fact, really doesn't, at least not so much with the advanced attackers. Because after we get the little ick computer here, where we have malware on one computer system, usually uh, at BHIS, and what we see a lot of bad guys dealing with, is they will then use protocols like PS exec, pass the token, our desktop, pass the hash, to pivot around the rest of the environment. And then once they pivot around the rest of the environment, they compromise additional workstations, and eventually it gets them full access to domain itself. Um, so we've got a couple of different questions here that we want to address real quick. Um, not even not even a question, but this is from somebody who's far smarter at uh, network-based forensics than anybody here, a gentleman by the name of Phil Hagen. Um, Phil, what is the course number for your class, uh, the network forensics? I want to say it's 575, but I'm not sure. Um, but he has a network forensics class at SANS, and he said a control pane app can do location-dependent lockdown for OSX, and it's at controlpaneapp.com, so location-dependent as well. Uh, Perry brought up a question. What already exists? The primary takeaway seems to be a bunch of other stuff based on exploits you've seen, and it still is implemented, tweak, implemented, and tweak. Absolutely, but that's now security. Um, that is, <laughs> This is truly a break from how security exists today, because the way security exists today for many organizations is a blacklist approach. We're going to find evil malware in AV. We're going to find evil malware communicating in our firewall logs going outbound. We're going to find evil malware in our intrusion prevention system. And whenever we're talking about internet whitelisting, we're flipping away from the blacklisting approach, and we're now moving into a whitelisting approach. Who is it that we are allowed to talk to? And in this situation with the workstations, the workstations are allowed to talk to servers, but the workstations will not be allowed to talk to each other. So these are fundamentally different than what we're seeing in most organizations. What do you think about OSSEC? I like that. Um, that is a perfectly cool kind of log management sim. It's good on small environments. Phil got me the uh, 
Uh, Phil got me the number, the class number for Phil's class is Forensics 572. Uh, Forensics 572. So, and actually, this should be cool because we had a whole bunch of people answering that question for Phil, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, da -da -da -da. Will two factors stop traversal attacks in a network? No, it won't, Edward. Uh, great, great question. Whenever you're looking at two-factor authentication, two-factor authentication helps authenticate to you. But if you're in an active directory environment, you're still granted a domain token, and then you use that domain token to access the network. So pass the token attacks will still work. Uh, so very, very, very cool. Um, oh, Phil is teaching the class in March out in Virginia Tech, so that'll be a little one. All right, so we can quickly move around the environment. So turn on the firewalls. You turn on your firewalls when you're at a coffee shop, segment business unit, organizational units. Why allow SMB and RPC between these different subnets? It locks these subnets down because we may be able to get code execution on a workstation. But if I'm locked on that workstation, I have to watch myself very carefully. And if I take a step off that workstation and try to access another workstation, you'll detect that because the firewall is going to light it up like a Christmas tree. Um, AV products um, have firewalls in them. Uh, McAfee, Symantec. Uh, Sophos, whenever we did our sacred cash cow tipping, we had to call out that Symantec would allow our code to execute, but as soon as it did, it did an alert and it said, hey, this executable is trying to talk online to this website. Do you want to allow that? And uh, that is a really, really good feature. Now, I don't think it's detecting malware very well, but, no. but the firewall itself works. Yeah. Um, works works very well um, for that. Unfortunately, we don't see that much in our customers. They don't really turn on the firewalls ever. No, if they find it annoying. Yeah, more, they just, more just, clicking. <laughs> just, just shut it down. No, we don't want to click on anything yeah. ever. So that restriction of lateral movement looks like this. If we compromise a single workstation and we try to do PS exec past the token, our desktop, or past the hash, those workstations inherently do not trust each other. And you will generate alerts and you'll be able to see that kind of lateral movement within the network and you'll be able to shut it down. So if somebody asked, is this a, uh, is this a, uh, is this anything new? Absolutely. Um, it is absolutely uh, without question something new because we very rarely see it at all. Um, question was, how do we like Malwarebytes and Fortigates? Um, Fortigate and Fortinet are good products. We have a couple over here. Um, they seem to be all right. We prefer Palo Alto because uh, Palo Alto is where we generally have to create custom malware uh, to get by, which doesn't take that long. But uh, they seem to be okay. And malware bytes for analysis, point analysis on possibly compromised computer systems is pretty good. Curtis, what do you mean I knew it? Um, what you, you're going to have to give us more context than I knew it in caps with an exclamation point. Um, so that's uh, uh, the Palo Alto. Oh, you think? Yeah. Uh, Silence, protect. Um, I was talking to another, another individual that did a test in an organization that was running Silence, protect. And it seems to be a fairly solid project product, but it seems to be more in line with what we're seeing now with Carbon Black. Um, I love Carbon Black. I absolutely love, um, I absolutely love Bit9. I think they're great products. But the issue with Carbon Black is it's almost too much noise. It's almost too much data. And a lot of these vendors are trying to give you as much as they possibly can. Um, it is, but it becomes difficult to actually sit down and effectively see the alerts itself. So there we go. Uh, what about ASAs? Once we're getting back into that thing of how do you feel about product vendor X? Product vendor X means nothing. Usually we don't even know that product vendor X is there. Palo Alto would be the one exception. With ASAs, we don't even know. I mean, we have those modules running. It just never really seems to come up. What about Bro? Oh, well, you got to talk to Derek. Uh, bro is a huge, uh, Derek is a huge Bro fanatic. It's insane. Yeah. Now, the difference about Bro is it's not really an IDS IPS system. It's more in line of like a, a language to query packets and get meaningful data out of it. And we love that. Though. That, thing, that thing's great. So if users are restricted from RDP on workstations and the built-in admin account password is different on all workstations, what's the benefit of having the desktop firewall? Um, if they're restricted, restricted from RDP, well, then you can still use SMB to talk to each other. You just want to restrict that lateral movement as much as possible. Um, what do we got here? God, how is bro spelled? Thanks, Alan. Jackass attendees. We see some of these people far too much. Um, have you tried to get past Palo Alto's traps? Now, that's going to be another sacred cash cow tipping with traps, and that also goes in the category of like FireEye and, as well. And there's a number of ways to bypassing those as well. Link to Bro, just Google Bro. Uh, you can even Google Bro IDS, 
And there's all kinds of great websites on there as well. WMI, absolutely, but that's over SMB and RPC. Dude, you're getting a bro. Now you guys are just screwing with me. I, I think that's uh, that's um, um, Onion. Um, a good Onion installation ran by somebody that knows how to use it is is fantastic. Um, and what's uh, bro? What was uh, Doug's company? I can't remember, but Doug Burke started up a company specifically uh, for doing implementations of Security Onion professional installations, and we love that as well. All right, so we talked about passwords. If we're trying to do better, we talked about our passwords are broke. The only thing that matters is length, um, and this is usually where people go really off tangents. Um, but at least 16 characters long, allow dictionary words, but keep the upper lowercase special character that's moving more into um, that's moving more into passphrases. And when we're cracking passwords, we break down what's the length of the passwords and crack like 98% of eight character passwords, 70% oh, yeah. of nine right. character passwords. You get to 16, you can actually still crack them. But the way OCL Hashcat Plus works when it cracks those really long passwords is generally not through brute forcing. But what it does is it takes the uh, dictionary lists and it starts doing combinations of the dictionary words. And there's a huge difference between us pat uh, cracking 70, 80, 90% of the passwords and cracking four. Um, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get that type of improvement um, in organizations that we're working with. So we talk about a lot of these things. And how do you go about trying to eat the elephant, right? And a lot of people say you eat it one bite at a time. I personally prefer chainsaws. But the issue is trying to jump straight into full implementation of a lot of these things. Let's do a full bit nine implementation. Let's do a tripwire implementation. And all of this kind of boils down to New Year's resolutions and past addictions. It's like, I'm going to give up smoking. I'm going to give up alcohol. I'm going to give up my crippling addiction to McGriddles. And ultimately, you fail at these things because you're trying to do far too much, far too quickly. So you got to stage it out. So if you're putting in firewalls, the best way to do a firewall implementation is enable the firewalls on your administrator's workstations first. Make sure that you can implement it correctly, test it, and then start breaking it out into different segments. If you're doing internet whitelisting, do the uncategorized uh, blacklist and allow all the other normal categories and, uh, and start there. And that's going to help out immensely. Even though it seems like it's crazy, it's going to make you more secure. Um, we're talking about app application whitelisting. Uh, you can't jump straight into bit nine, but let's step up into it. Let's do software restriction policies, app lockers, and even bit nine, actually. You can restrict where programs are allowed to execute as well. So these are kind of the new fundamentals that we're basically trying to we're, we're trying to get into a scenario where we're doing better. So we got some questions here I want to roll through. Um, the Australian director identified 100 common websites with watering hole vulnerabilities. Is this defense if it's on the website? Yep, you're still gonna, no, you're still gonna have websites that are gonna allow you to exploit your systems. I'm not saying it's 100%. And this is the trap that's set, right? They say, well, the whitelisting thing can be bypassed by these ways. Okay, so we got 100 websites. That's better than the 4,000, 400,000, 4 million that are hosting malware right now that are bypassed through blacklisting. So we're trying to get better. And whenever we're talking about bypassing these things, yeah, I mean, that's what we do. We bypass these things. But it's easier for us to build upon a structure that has a better foundation than trying to do blacklisting. Also, if we're going with that, if there's if there's vulnerabilities on those websites or they're using watering hole style exploit kits, you may get the initial compromise on your computer system. But once the command and control channel is trying to be established, it's going to be shut down. So or most likely it's going to be shut down. So, yeah, you may still have systems get compromised, but it makes me trying to establish a solid command and control session out of the environment far, far, far more difficult. Um, so that's that's a great point. Is there a major shift of passphrases? Won't the benefits decrease significantly and the efforts to crack them will be around combining dictionary, different dictionary words? Yes and no. Um, you're still going to be able to crack some, but you're not going to be able to crack 90, 60, 40 percent of them. If, I mean, if we're cracking you know, 50, 60 percent, let's say it's 100,000, we're cracking 40,000, 60,000, 70,000 versus cracking 20. I'll take the 20. I, I think the 20 is an improvement. And that's ultimately where we need to go, right? Um, have you tested the new version of Sysmon logging raw disk and Volmin access to help with detection of a breach? Um, we've used it on some IR gigs. I'm pretty much the main one that does IR gigs here at uh, BHIS. And we always, always start with these tools. We're starting with the network access first. And then we move into seeing what is accessing the network, what are the files associating with those network access reads and writes. 
What are the executables and the dynamic link libraries associated with them? So generally, you start with the network access, then you move down and you look at the binaries themselves, then you look at the dynamic link libraries associated with them as well. Um, Doug's company, Chris found it, is securityonionsolutions.com. Um, so please go check that out as well. Uh, Josh uh, from CrowdStrike did a great presentation at B-Sides New York City on network hunting covering Bro, uh, Lakia Boss, and Moloch. Yes, and we, you know, we, I, I would throw Rita into that mix as well. Um, that's on our website. Uh, it's going to go into a little bit of a lull for development because we're coming up with something special here in a little while, but Rita is going with that as well. Uh, Jason Fawson of 504 Instructor has a great spreadsheet for password link. Um, he's just going to try to find that link for us if he can. What kind of link do you recommend for devices that use pins? I've got a really, really weird view on mobile device security. I know my phone is right over there. The biggest thing that we have for mobile device security is the fact that um, if I take your phone, you start getting really uncomfortable. And most devices don't go past four pins or four digits anyway. Um, so the best thing you can do for mobile device security is don't lose your device and then having remote wipe capability as well. Would love to give up Trend Micro this year. You know, hey, everyone has, you know, hopes as well. Uh, da, 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 da. Local admins. Uh, so now, so for local administrator, Microsoft released a tool called LAPS. And what LAPS does is it randomizes the local administrator password on every single system that's in the LAPS, uh, LAPS environment. And it's a great tool. The problem with LAPS is every once in a while it has a LAPS and it misses some systems. That was a really horrible joke. I should really just punish myself for that. Uh, so check out Microsoft LAPS as well. Bit9 offers professional services. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, if you're looking at Bit9, let's say it's $100,000 to implement it in a small environment. And uh, you're like, oh, we can implement this ourselves. And they're like, it's another 100,000 to roll in some pros to implement it pay for the services. I had a number of their uh, professional service engineers in my SANS class at uh, the Tuscany last week, which was pretty cool. Um, so let's go XKCD password. Yes, it is. Just don't ever use correct horse battery staple. Um, da, 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 SANS.org. Here we go. Let me copy this and paste it to everyone. So we'll go B. And we'll send to all. There's the password link spreadsheet. Have you ever done or could you do a webinar dedicated to internet whitelisting? Yeah, we could do a case study on that. Um, it wouldn't be a full hour. Probably only be about a half an hour as well. <laughs> what Rob Fuller, um, who is one of the sharpest dressed men in, in computer security, hands down, um, it, he said, what's the point of trying to do security right if people with great beards just break it? Or people with names like Rob Fuller are teaching the people with great beards on how to break it. Much respect for, for, for Mubix as well. Um, if a restricted admin credentials, I'm not whitelisting. Okay, that's just a statement. Uh, da, 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 da. Have you found a new home for ADHD? Um, if you go to the BHIS website, we're holding it on Mega. Um, yep, that's right. We've decided that Kim.com is a more upright, upstanding citizen than the fine people at SourceForge. Uh, so if you go to the BHIS website, we're now hosting things on, um, we're now hosting, David finally got the joke, the lapse joke. Um, we're now hosting things on the uh, on Mega because it seems to work really, really, really well. Um, question about lo Windows local administrators. My question is, what is your opinion on letting users be full admin versus taking the time to lock down the users? Ah! <laughs> Don't make them local admin, no, please. No, it's just, it's terrible. just bad. Um, uh, so yay, mega. Have you ever tested Microsoft Advanced Threat Analytics? Yes. Um, uh, right now, right next door, Rick is setting up Microsoft Advanced Threat Analytics. Um, and does it detect lateral movement consistency? Yes, it does, especially when you do it fast. Um, if you're using scripts like the PowerShell Empire scripts, it will detect that, but it forces our lateral movement to then become very deliberate and slow. Um, it's not something that we can go through very, very quickly uh, anymore. It's kind of like an, in Dune, they had the shield, and if you came in too fast, it would, it would stop it. But if you came in slow, it would allow it in. How's that for a geek reference? Um, for referencing Frank Herbert. Um, but yeah, you have to move a lot slower as well. Uh, developers, developers, is Emit dead? No, Emit is awesome. Um, Emit is awesome because it allows you to wrap applications that have crappy security implementations and actually start trying to secure them as well. So it's great. Uh, no, 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 it's it's. Uh, look under projects. Uh, look under, oh, BHIS services. Do bhis.co. Uh, that's probably the better website to go to as well. 
Moabdeeb. Oh, uh, yes, the yeah. little 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 small mouse. Yeah. Very very good. Uh, worm sign negative. All right. Know of any of the local admin password? I like I would use Math Labs. Uh, there was a script on Security Weekly two years ago where they showed you how you could do it just through PowerShell as well. IP addresses are uncategorized. How do I allow this and block uncategorized websites? Uh, how do you IP? So you'd have to allow those IP addresses in, or you'd have to create your own regular expression filter as well. Um, bring your own device. Uh, so this is a great question. Mark brought up, what about bring your own device, cloud-based services? Um, God, what's his name? He's an IANS faculty, Aaron Turner, um, who's one of the best bring your own device security experts in the world. Uh, he has a great presentation on how bring your own device and security are dead. Uh, he basically says you can create a Venn diagram, draw two circles, have security here, Bring your own device here. Notice those circles should never talk to each other. Um, and that gets into other things about what you can do at the perimeter and hunt teaming. But look at the Rito presentation at DerbyCon. And uh, that would fall into that category as well. Uh, no, Macs can't get malware. But if they could, what application whitelisting methods have you been used successfully? I'd go back to the link that we popped up earlier from uh, Phil Hagen as well. Do you have any successful attacks against Windows 10 box with Device Guard? Um, we Got Windows 10 boxes here that we're running malware on. Um, I don't know. Uh, IT folks are uncomfortable with outright blocking on categories or none. Most proxies support blocking executable file types. That's fine, Mark, as long as you have a full SSL interception and you'll be able to see those MIME header types as they come through. If you're not intercepting SSL, then that's a huge blind spot where it's allowed in as well. Um, have you ever used Symantec Data Center Security DCS? You come and comment about its capabilities and file integrity monitoring. It's a fine file integrity monitoring product. It's fine for zero days. It is perfectly cool for servers. Check it out. Any ideas around Shadow IT and how to protect that once we find it living in AWS Rackspace? To be honest, Brian, that's a problem that we're working on right now with some of our products that we have in AWS right now. That'll be a webcast coming up later on in a year. Um, is the advice to never do any day-to-day -day work as local admin still appropriate? Yes, absolutely. Um, if you look at Metasploit and Interpreter, they have UAC bypass techniques yep. that work just, just fine. Oh, yeah, yep, definitely. So, all right, so that was a lot of questions. Uh, so let's try to tie this up. I didn't find a really cool picture of you with your beard um, that I can throw in. I'll, I'll need that. Um, I'll need that here in a little bit. Um, so I'll need that as well. By the way, for the WebSense folks out there, Cheryl just brought up, WebSense does not accurately block, block executables inspected SSL traffic. So please, please, please keep that, uh, keep that open. Um, Darren brought up something that's a rant. Currently, there's a huge push. Uh, State of New York is looking into it. The Democratic debates, they were talking about it, about how they want to break uh, encryption. They don't want to have companies hand over the keys to the NSA, but they want to make sure the government has the ability to break encryption. Um, that is a huge, huge, huge webcast that will be coming up shortly. So I want to say thanks. And hopefully this is just the beginning of the conversation. Um, you know, we got our email addresses, uh, my Twitter handle. We'll get a really fa fa fancy picture of Brian that we can throw up, preferably in black and white. And I'm wearing that exact shirt today. Oh, nice. um, that works out really, really, really well uh, for it as well. So uh, they're doing a great job protecting. Stupid idea. John likes plaid shirts. I do because I'm a lumberjack and I'm okay. Okay, so what was the favorite uh, Bowie song based on the poll? It was hands down Space Oddity. Um, uh, that was uh, that was hands down the biggest one. Second was Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars. Uh, so very, very, very big, uh, big props to David Bowie as well. So what is the best AV? Uh, uh, Panda. Okay. I would say Panda, hands down. That's great. Panda That's is a great cool. antivirus. You know what? They're going to take this video and they're going to like snip it out and they're going to put that in <laughs> without sarcasm as, as well. All right. Well, thanks again, everybody. Get out of here. We'll make the recording available for everybody. And uh, you guys have an excellent, excellent weekend.